How you doing, Cap City Church? My name is Evan Pisani, and I am excited to talk to you guys today. We are starting a sermon series today called With All My Heart, and we're going to be continuing it to next week as well, so make sure you do not miss it. We're going to be having a great conversation next week as well with um, with uh, Vito, our worship pastor here at Cap City Church. It is going to be worth it in preparing for this next week as well. We've had some great conversations. Trust me, you're not going to miss, want to miss it. But today, today we are going to be talking about praise. We're going to be talking about praise. And I'm really excited about this because praise is something that's near and dear to my heart. And it's something that uh, I think that we can all grow in, really. And so we're actually going to jump right into the text right away because I don't want to wait any longer. I want to talk about it. I'm excited. You guys ready for this? All right, so I'm going to give a little context to the story that we're jumping into. We're going to be talking about David. And I, I love David. He's such a great worshiper. Um, but we're, we're, going to, we're going to focus on David right now and kind of the origin of his story. But I, I don't want you guys to zone out being like, I've heard this a million times. No, we're going to look into it with a slightly different light today. So don't miss out on, on, on the details of here. Make sure you're taking notes. If you're taking notes, go ahead and open up to 1 Samuel 17, 17 through 18. I'm going to give a little context. David is uh, among many brothers, but he is one of the youngest. So he is staying at home, tending to the sheep while his brothers are out on the battlefield. Now, the battlefield is essentially two hills. It's the Israelites over here and the Philistines over here. And um, right smack in the middle is a valley. And what had been happening at this time is actually the champion of the Philistines, Goliath, has come out in front and has challenged Israel's champion, as he says, says, come out and fight me. And whoever is victorious will enslave the others. Basically saying, this dude's like nine foot nine, by the way. Scientists believe that this dude is nine foot around that size. He's massive. Um, and Every piece of equipment of equipment that he owns weighs very like ex, like very heavy bronze and all that kind of stuff. And he actually had an iron uh, 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 um, tip to his jaw to his spear because it would have been kind of entering into the Iron Age around this time. And everything that he had would have been very heavy. This man is mad. He's big like brooding dude. And so the Israelites are, are, are reasonably terrified of this man and they're not doing much to combat him and to send out their champion, whoever that might have been. They're not doing anything. And so that's what's happening at this time. So let's go ahead and pick up in 1 Samuel 17, 17 through 18. Verse 17 says, And Jesse said to David his son, Take your brothers an ephah of this parched grain, and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of the thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. You know what I think is really cool about just this small part of Scripture? Something that it reveals? Is sometimes when we're on the battlefield, we run low on what we need and what we have. And sometimes we're on the battlefield. I, I don't know if you guys have noticed this in your life. I know it's very certain in my life. Sometimes when I'm out in the battlefield that we call this journey of life and we're just struggling day in and day out. And what I've noticed is that sometimes right when we're at the cusp of needing it, God sends someone or God brings us exactly what we need. And so what David is doing is he's bringing these resources, these snacks, these foods to not only the brother, but to the leader of his thousand and, and supporting them with snacks. And what's happening is it's right as these guys need some sort of nourishment, the Lord is bringing them something in our lives. Come on, let me hear you in this place. Comment if you agree with this, that sometimes in our lives when we are struggling and we feel empty and our tank is not running like it should be, and we don't know what to do because we are running out of what we need. And what happens is God brings us exactly what we need right when we need it. Have you guys ever noticed that? It's almost like he knows what we need. It almost is like he knows what we can handle. It almost is like he has a plan that he is playing out in our lives. And sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we don't see it. Or sometimes maybe we forget but it's always right when we need it. However, do we always believe that? Do you and I always believe that? 
That, that, that when we need it most, something will happen. When we're struggling desperately, that breakthrough will come. Do we always believe that? Do you? Ask yourself this. Do we externally exhort how we believe for something to happen? When we say it maybe in the past, do we externally exhort in those seasons of struggle that, that we believe breakthrough is coming? Do we externally ex- exhort or do we, do, we, do, we, do we shout out how we're feeling truthfully? I remember when I was in high school, I used to wrestle. Um, and uh, I, I remember I wasn't like the most extraordinary wrestler. Like I was lanky. I was about like 100 pounds, so I could squeeze out about any hold. Um, but I usually lost due to points of takedown points. I was pretty scrawny and weak. Um, but I remember this, this one time we were having a home game, and we were one of the first D.C. public schools to have a wrestling team. So we wrestled just about anyone we could find. And uh, one of the schools was a Catholic school that had, I believe, middle school and high school combined. And, and, and we were getting ready for this game. And the day of, we go in the morning um, of the match, and it was a school day, and we did weigh-ins. And um, I was like, oh, I'm overweight, guys. I'm five pounds overweight. And uh, it's a struggle, guys. I'm Italian. Don't don't look at me like that. I'm Italian. I got to eat. And uh, especially as a growing high schooler and my coach expects me to be on weight. Like, you know, like, no, I, I should have been on weight. But that's besides the point. But I, I, all I know is I was five pounds overweight. And that's an issue because that means I would have had to been bump up a weight class, which means that that's up to like 15 pounds of muscle mass that this person could have more than me. And that would have been maybe more of a struggle. And so here's the thing. I, 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 I was in class. Our classes were 90-minute periods. We had fewer classes throughout the day. Uh, they were just longer, um, which was gruesome. I remember that much. Um, it was very gr- grueling, not gruesome. And I, I remember I'm sitting in my last period, just sat down, like just sat down, got comfortable. And I was getting in the mental capacity uh, uh, to get ready for English. And I hear on the intercom, uh, Evan, uh, please come to the, uh, to the, to the gym. Or, or I don't recall exactly what I was called, but it was, it was please come to this office or something like that of that effect. And I'm like, oh God, you, what did I do this time? Like, I, well, like, what, well, like, well, you never want to hear your name on the intercom. Like, it's like, you know, when you hear it, then everybody starts going, ooh, like you did something terrible. But what happens is I, I go to this office and my coach is there and he says, hey, you're five pounds overweight. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry. I guess you have to bump me up or something like I. Uh, lost was something I was used to, so I didn't really mind it at that time. And he says, no, you're, you're not getting bumped up. He says, did you bring a sweater or anything like that? And I'm like, no, it's the middle of the summer. Why would I bring a sweater to school? And I thought that was funny. And, you know, he kind of, he did this thing where he's like, <laughs> and then his like laugh disappeared. And I knew in that moment that I was in some serious trouble. I was like, oh, oh no, oh no. And the uh, so what happens is, is, is he finds several of my teammates who had uh, sweatshirts or, or winter coats in their closets um, that were just there. I don't know why. And um, he gave them to me. And it wasn't just that. Like, I had a beanie on and all that stuff. Like, it was, it was, it was a lot of material. And he said, I want you to put on these two layers of sweatshirts, and I want you to put on this winter coat. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, sure. And then he takes me to the, to the, to the basketball gym where we're going to be training um, after a class. And he says, I want you to run laps for the rest of this period. That's 90 minutes. And y'all, let me be honest. I'm not like a cardio wizard. Like I, I couldn't run at this time in my life. I could not run a mile without stopping or feeling nauseous. Like I was not the kind of guy who did cardio for 90 minutes. And he was in there the whole time. So if I slowed down or stopped, he would call me out and say, hey, keep going, keep going. When I say I felt like a walking zombie by the end of that class, I mean it. Like, Lord have mercy I was beat up. Like, I I probably looked like a zombie at that point. I'm sure I had pale skin and, like, beady eyes. Like, I don't, like, 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 I don't, I don't know. But anyway, so, so, so then the coach says to me, I want you to go weigh in again. So I go and I weigh in. I get all that, the, the heavy uh, equipment off me and I go and weigh in and, um, after 90 minutes of consecutive running and sweating in a hot gym, 
I find out that I actually lost five pounds that I needed to lose. Well, almost. I lost 4.5. I was 0.5 over. I was so close to being where I needed to be and I was overweight. So what happens is, is, is I'm, I'm dehydrated. I can't drink water until the match is getting ready to start. And I've, I just, I'm dizzy. And in my head, I'm like, I'm not going to win this. I have no chance. I wasn't really thinking highly of myself. We go to the mat and as I get ready to get into my stance to wrestle, I, I notice something about this kid. I notice he looks, I don't know, nervous or something. So when I go up to grapple him, um, we, 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 I, I, we, you kind of test out people's strength a little bit by throwing them every once in a while or, or whatever. And I go to test his strength and the dude just hits the ground and I throw him into a pin and I win. And that was the first match I've ever won in my entire, actually the only match I ever won. Um, and I was so excited. I was like, man, like I, I knew I could do it this whole time. Like, I, I, I don't know why y'all were doubting me. And my coach is like, you proud of yourself? I was like, yeah, I was so, I was so proud of myself. I'm so proud of myself. I worked hard to be here. And my coach, he does that same thing where he's like smiling and laughing. And then his face drops and he's like, good. He's like, that kid was in like seventh grade. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> no, why are you going to, I'm, a, I'm a, like a junior. And I'm like so excited. I finally won. You got to tell me this, this is like some kid in the seventh grade from some Catholic high school where it was all together. Like, why would you tear me down like that? And, and so I'm telling this story just because it's funny and because and it relates to the message. But I want to point something out about this story a little bit. Now, I want to get personal. Here's the thing. Do we become fearful and unsure of an outcome of a situ certain situation that we've been placed in because of a deeper reaching issue? Is it because we feel unsure about God and, 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 and trusting him, even if we've seen him break through in the past? Is it because we feel unsure about God, about what he can do for us? Or is it because we sometimes feel unsure about ourselves? Or is it even further than that? Is it just the fact that life is scary sometimes? Is it, is it the fact that, man, I, 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 there's no guarantee that life is going to be fair? And life is not fair. It was never designed to be. Can I, can I say something bold to all of us that I think all of us need to hear? That we don't value praise because we don't truly know what praise is. We don't value praise because we don't truly know what praise is. Did you know that there are seven forms of praise utilized in the Old Testament? Seven forms. Meaning that praise is not just singing. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to say that. In 1 Samuel, I want you guys to open up your Bibles again. 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 49. We're going to continue the story of David and Goliath. Verse 38 says, When Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of bronze on his head, and clothed him with a coat of mail, David strapped on his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David pulled them off. And he took his staff from his hand and uh, into his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them into his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Here's what it gets interesting. Verse 41 says, And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David. With the shield bearer in front of him and with the Philistine looked, he saw David. He disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. For those of you who don't know, that would have been like a terrible insult. That would have been considered worse than death to the Israelites at this time. Then David says to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name 
of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. The day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give you to the earth. I will give you to the... Uh, sorry. The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and will give you to the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines. This day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that this assembly may know that God saves not through the sword and spear. For this battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly up to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone stank Uh, The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Let's talk a little bit about what David's going through. And then also let's talk about what Saul's going through. What can we learn from their responses in this situation? Let's, Let's talk about Saul's response first off, okay? Saul, the king of his people, technically would have been the champion to go and fight this Philistine. But he remained afraid in that place. David wasn't even fighting his own fight. He was fighting someone else's fight. David wasn't even supposed to be there in the first place. David was there because he was bringing food to his brothers and he saw what was happening and he said, how dare you curse the armies of my living God, of our, the armies of the living God not just his. Saul's response was a response of fear. He couldn't find the courage to go out and step out to fight that battle. But David, David stepped with a confidence, with a a breath of, of boldness in every single step he took. He stood up. And just because he spoke out, he was actually called to go to the king. And the king gave him his armament, gave him his armor and his sword. And he said, go fight this fight for me, essentially. And David walked around a little bit in the, in the armor and he said, I haven't tested this. I don't, this doesn't, this doesn't work for me. I, I haven't tested this armor. I don't know what it's capable of. I don't know what I'm capable of with it. And he steps out and defeats Goliath. Like I said before, it turns out that there are seven different forms of praise in the Old Testament. And that that goes all the way from declaration to to singing out like we do on Sundays. It's not the only form of praise, I'm telling you. To shouting, to declaring. Guys, there there are several ways to praise the name of the Lord. And I actually want to read Psalm 149, 6 really quick. It says, May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands. And this would have been written by David, talking about preparing for battle and meeting victory. May the praise of God be on their mouths and the double-edged sword in their hands. He's not talking about singing while going into battle, guys. The actual, when you, when you look into the depth of what this means, he's actually saying, may the praise of God be in their throats, like a shout, and armed with a double-edged sword in their hands. Was praise the right response all along? Does praise have to do more with the battlefield than we actually realize? Is it just something that happens afterwards? Because I, I, from what we know about Saul, Saul had, had had incredible victories before this where, where he didn't, he shouldn't have won against the Philistines. And, and what, what had happened is they had literally like three swords in the entire army and everybody had farming equipment. If you read into the text, they had no blacksmiths in a previous battle and they found victory. And what had happened is that Saul praised himself. Does the, does, the, does the place in which we place our praise affect our response in the following battle? 
is this is this is this is this an issue of placement? Is this an is- issue of courage? Is it, this is an issue issue of praise? Not just placement, but praise in itself. I want to point something out really quick. What David does as he walks up to the Philistine isn't just roasting the Philistine back. The Philistine's doing what he can to make David afraid to affect him on the battlefield. But what David is doing is he's walking up to this Philistine and he's speaking into existence his praises. He's walking up to this Philistine and he's literally saying to him that it is not I who will defeat you, but the living God who will take you down. And in our lives, I can't help but to think about seasons in which we are struggling, in which we feel defeated, in which we feel fearful because the giant is too large. And we can't help but to shake in our boots, not realizing that all we have to do is take a step forth and to speak into existence the victories that God has had prepared for us. Because this experience is an experience that will cause the enemy to fall, not on their back as we read here, but to fall on their face before God. Goliath should have fallen on his back after being struck in the head hard enough for the rock to sink into his skull, but he fell on his face, prostrated before the Lord. That's what a praise can do. A praise can cause the very enemy who had an entire nation terrified to fall to his face before the glory of the Lord. A praise can build up your confidence in a season where you lack to the point where you meet that victory, to that point where you learn that lesson, to the point where you find that confidence, to the point where the giants of finance, to the point where the giants of confidence, to the point where the giants of depression, to the point of those giants in our lives meet their end. Because the Lord has a plan. And when we praise into them with a declaration, a statement, a war cry, a battle cry, speaking into existence, what happens is unbelievable. See, David couldn't have taken Saul's sword because he had to go not only find his own victory, but capture his own sword. And Saul would have never known that. Saul couldn't have known that. David had to find his own victory and know for sure that God was with him by shouting that this is God's army. This is a soldier of God. You will not come against me because by default you are making fun of God, the living God. And by that, he goes and finds his own sword and eventually becomes king. And this sword is not stored as a memorable piece in the center of the city square. In fact, it's stored in the temple because it's not a memory of what he had done himself in his own strength. It is a memory of the day that God brought them victory. If only we had the perception at times to realize that the armor and sword won't fit us because they're someone else's. Because we're not practiced in that sword and shield. Because the thing that doesn't feel natural at first, the thing that actually is more natural than we believe, even though it's considered supernatural, is praising the name of the Lord on the account of the victory that is yet to come. I love If you read through all of Psalm, and I'm closing up real quick. If you read through all of Psalms, I love reading through Psalm because what you read is you read a man who is desperate. You read about David who is crying out to the Lord, Lord, I'm surrounded. I can't win this fight. I don't know what to do. You also read a man who finds encouragement and ends with praise. He says, but I know that you'll show through time and time again, but I know that you're here with me time and time again and that you'll never leave me. And I think in life sometimes, all the time, it's okay to be discouraged. But what we do in the discouragement is so vital. 
And I'm not saying we won't find victory if we don't praise God, but I'm saying that when you praise God in the victory, it turns our losses into lessons and it turns our victories into battle cries. When we praise God into as a shout of praise, Father, I believe in your victory that will come. This is your victory over the enemy. When we shout our battle cries of praise, what we meet is something that will never make sense. And that is his plan. What we meet is that he finds glory. What we meet is that there's breakthrough. I want to point out one more thing. Then I'll close. As I said before, may the praise of God be in your throats like a double and a double-edged sword in your hands. I love that they talk about double-edged sword because I don't know if you guys remember this, but there's a verse in Hebrews 4.12 that says, For the Lord of the word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Armed with a shout of praise in my mouth and the word of the Lord in my hand. Wow, what an image. It's almost as if it's a perpetual cycle that you find the ability to praise the Lord when you have this word in your hands. It's almost as if the the perpetual nature of understanding or or reading the word or being armed with the double-edged sword that is the word of the Lord gives us the confidence to shout those praises because we can read in context moments when he came through and it gives us perspective into our past when God came through, even when we didn't realize it, even before we were saved. And now that it gives us the empowerment to shout out in praise that he will come through. I, I want to give an action step to everybody and I want to give this this the solution How do we find praise within us when we feel empty? The Lord always provides. And sometimes all you have to do is pray. And I want to be honest, sometimes the battlefield we find ourselves in is is actually the prayer that we've been praying for and we don't realize it. I remember in high school asking for confidence. And I found myself in moments that required confidence that I didn't think I had in me. It's called praying dangerous prayers because when you pray for these things, God will put you in the situations for you to learn those things. But I I, want to give my first action step, which is all my heart. Praise with all my heart. Not just on Sundays. If the only praise you can do is to sing a song, then let that be a praise but declare those words over your lives as you sing them. Don't let it just become a a, a singing along. If that's all you can manage in the moment because you're so broken, then let that be that. But sometimes just listening is enough and praising in your mind. But I'm saying with your heart, with all my heart, I sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Or I sing, lead me out upon the waters where my faith will be tested. Or I sing, with all my heart. Sometime when you're at home or, or if you're in your car, if you have to let out a literal shout, and you may look crazy, it doesn't matter. But I'm saying a praise that says, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm going through. God, I am struggling. I can't see in front of me. I can't see what's happening around me. I am dealing with this. But then you end it with, Father, but I know for your glory, you are going to bring a victory. Now that's praise. Now that's a battle cry. And the second one I want to say is arm yourself with the word. I know sometimes it's hard to remember. I know the Bible can be boring sometimes. But what I want to say to you is that you're not allowing it to come alive. When you read it and put it into real context and you deep dive and you discover the beauty of the of the word, it will never cease to amaze you. And trust me with that, because the Lord will speak to you through those pages. You just have to dig deep sometimes. And actually, I wanted to give an opportunity. And this would be remiss of me if I didn't talk about this, but I'm talking about praise to the Lord and and it'd be remiss to me not to 
talk about the fact that this all leads to Jesus. This all leads to Jesus. The very person who several thousand, two thousand years ago died on the cross for our sins so that all we have to do is praise him. He removed the weight of sin from our lives. We no longer have to struggle with sacrificing animals because the sacrifice was made already. And now we're all anointed. We're all anointed. I spoke a message on that a while ago, not too long ago, about anointing. We are all anointed. We're all smiled upon. And wherever you are right this moment, broken, perfect, whole, whatever you feel, I just want to say that God's smiling on you. He loves you. And he's picking you just as you are right now, sitting on that couch, sitting on that chair, sitting in your car. He has picked you right now, exactly as you are. And he says that he wants you to know him more. He wants to know you more. He wants this friendship to develop, this love, this, this relationship to develop. Wherever you are, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And I want you, if at any point during this message, you're like, man, I, I haven't been praising God. I, I, haven't been, I haven't been speaking into existence. I haven't been, I haven't been looking at this from the right perspective. If, if that's you and, and maybe you in your heart know that you aren't really following Jesus or, or you've walked away from the church or, or years ago or, or you've just never made that decision, you didn't know that there was a love to see you succeed in life. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, come into my heart. Make me like new. Shape me into whatever you need me. Speak to me. Forgive me of my sins. Any mistakes I've made, any times I've missed the mark, forgive me. Make me like brand new. Come into my heart wholeheartedly, I say this. I love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Let me pray over everybody really quick. Father God, I thank you for every single person listening to this, Lord. I pray that you are touching their hearts. And as they go throughout this week, Lord, that you're encouraging them, Lord. That you're reminding them, Lord. That you're uh, uh, existing within their praise, Father. That you're giving them sight into the giant that's on the field in front of them. I thank you for a boldness wherever we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.